Hello, my name is Carrie Barnum, and I am here for Free Advice Friday, the hour every Friday where we get together to talk about book marketing, publishing, anything to do with the business of being an author. Today, we are going to jump right in with some email questions. And the first question was about leaving reviews when you yourself are an author. So, so often as authors, we know that getting reviews is hard to do. These little reviews are like gold. But oftentimes when I ask authors, hey, when's the last time you left a review on a book? They have to stop and think about it. And oftentimes it's been a really long time since they left reviews for another author. And this is kind of one of those things because when you are writing and you work in this industry, you definitely want to support your fellow authors, but you also have to be a little bit careful you want to make sure that you are not um, that you're not leaving too many harsh reviews. And so I get the question all the time. All right, I'll leave a review. I'll get active on a review platform like Goodreads or BookBub or even Amazon. But how how do I do it? What parameters do I put around that as an author? And so my answer is almost always. The golden rule that your mom probably taught you, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. And that's my rule, is that if you don't have something nice to say, just don't review the book. If you've read a book either from a friend or from another author that you've never met and you just thought it was terrible, just don't say anything. That's all right in this case. There are those people who will point out the flaws in since you're in this industry, it's just not your job. It's not a smart move. If you cannot leave, I would say at the very minimum, a three-star review, but preferably a four or five star. If you can't say nice things, just don't say anything. Don't rate it. Don't review it. Um, some people I know will actually review under a spouse's account or a partner's account. So if they do have anything a little more honest to say, um, it's not connected directly to their name. That's an option, I guess. But really, again, if you don't have nice things to say, just don't review it. If it's someone that you know, if it's someone who has asked you to review their book and they come back and they follow up and they say, hey, I noticed you didn't review my book. Depending on your relationship with them, you might say, you know, it really wasn't my cup of tea. And so I, I wasn't really raving about it, or I saw this issue or that issue. And so since I couldn't just give you a raving review, I thought it would be best to leave it off. Again, depends on your relationship with that person um, and how much they're asking you on that follow-up. But that's how I personally recommend you handle that. Now, I will say that there are, you know, we always hear about Amazon's terms and how you have to be really careful of Amazon's terms to not anger the Amazon review gods. And as long as you're not swapping reviews with authors, you're not saying, hey, you review my book for five stars and I'll review your book. And there's a lot of that kind of thing. They track the kind of algorithms. Um, then you should be fine. Worst case scenario, as long as, again, you're not like obviously swapping reviews. If you were just reading books and reviewing them as you go, um, one or two happen to be authors that you're in contact with and others are not. It shouldn't really be a problem. Occasionally, it'll simply say, hey, we're not going to post that review or that review will just never show up. It's not a big deal. Um, and so, yes, so Elaine has a great point. I can always find good things to say, but the star rating really stumps me. There are some review platforms where you don't have to star rate and you can still leave a review. Goodreads does this, I believe. Um, Amazon used to, I think you have to leave a star rating now, but, but you can just write good things and not give it a star rating. So that may be your middle ground. The overall idea though, is that you can still support fellow authors, whether you know them or not. But again, if we can't be nice, just don't say anything. And then the question comes up of, okay, as an author, if I'm on review platforms, not so much Amazon because that's not as much of a social platform, but if we're talking about BookBub, if we're talking about Goodreads, then how much of your reading do you want out there for your followers and your readers to see? And that's a really personal decision. You may say, 
you know, I write nonfiction, but I really love a spicy romance novel. If you are open about that, if you don't mind putting it up there, go for it. If, however, you feel like it doesn't go with your brand or it's not something that, um, it's not something that you just put out there, not that there's anything wrong with it, but maybe it's just not something that you put out there for your mother-in-law to see, I don't know, then you don't have to. Again, it's really up to what you're comfortable with, but don't feel like readers are judging you based on what you read. If you write on a serious topic and you like lighter um, books, that's okay. It's just like TV. I mean, just because someone's a really serious actor doesn't mean we don't think that they would enjoy the Big Bang Theory or something that's kind of more light and funny. It's okay to have diversified taste. So it's really up to you on how much you publicly are willing and openly going to share about your reading habits. And from there, it's kind of open. But I do think it's really great to get involved in some of these platforms and actually review books. BookBub in particular is a really great one to do. A lot of us um, really want a BookBub feature deal. We want BookBub promotions. And I'm telling you now that when an author is really active on BookBub, they're reviewing books, they are, they're liking, they've got their own profile set up. I'm telling you now, BookBub can see that when you apply for a feature deal. Anytime you apply for a promotion with BookBub, it's through your account or it's through your book, which links to your account and they can see that. And I have definitely seen where they have got given um, extra consideration, reviews on their blog, different things like that for authors who are really active on their platform. So when you are essentially supporting their platform, when you're using it to review and to recommend they take note of that. And it certainly is not going to hurt your chances. So and same thing with Goodreads. You, if you think that your audience is on Goodreads, if you write something like cozy mysteries, let's say, and you think your audience is on Goodreads, hey, you know, a really good way to interact with them, tell them what you're reading, recommend other books to them, interact with them in that way. And that is how you find not just readers, but how you find a community of readers who really feel like they know you. They feel like they are, they're like, oh, I mean, I trust her book reviews. If she recommends this book, I'm going to trust it. So I'm going to love her next book. So really don't be afraid to get in there and just start leaving your own reviews. And yes, I would do it under your author name. Uh, there's nothing wrong with Again, there are some people I know who leave under a partner's name or something along those line, an old account. Um, some, some sites like Amazon have terms where you're not supposed to have more than one personal account for you. Um, so you have to be careful of that. But otherwise, if you want to do it under a different account just to support authors, that's up to you. But just know that as far as building your community, that's not going to work. So you have to decide again, how much you wanna put out in the public and how much you're not, you wanna support authors, but you don't want it out of the public. Uh, yeah, and the questions coming up is, I've just been asked to pay $30 by someone who says she'll post on her book club page and Goodreads and other pages sites. Is it worth it? I always go look at those people's profiles for the most part, I recommend that you pitch to people who just are going to read and review your book because they love it. Uh, occasionally, there is a time where I've worked with authors who will pay for promotional spots on someone's social media or something along those lines, but I always look at those accounts to make sure, number one, that they are actually active, that they don't just have a lot of followers and essentially they're bots and that's it. Um, and also, are those followers active? Are they commenting on posts? Are they talking about the books afterwards? And that's kind of what I base it on. Um, and just so you know, it is against Amazon's terms of service to pay for someone to review um, your book on Amazon. So it's not illegal to pay a marketing company or a service to pitch reviewers asking them to leave reviews. But it is against the terms of service to say, hey, if you go leave a review on Amazon, I'll give you 20 bucks. That is absolutely against the terms. So 
uh, you once again, you got to kind of walk that line. And it's one thing when you're paying for a review, it's another when you're paying for promotion. And you have to make sure that if you're paying for promotion, it's one worth the money. See, so how do we weed out the relevant reviews from the zillions of book bloggers, podcasters, and um, uh, book talkers? Well, that question, if you could clarify, are you asking how you weed out the relevant reviewers as far as who to pitch or who to pay or the reviewers that as a reader you want to trust? Um, if it's as a reader, I always look. I am one of those people when I go and I look at a book and I want to see if I'm going to like it or any product. I look at five-star reviews and I look at the one-star reviews. I want to see what people are raving about and I want to see what people have a problem with. Because sometimes the thing people have a problem with is something that's not going to affect me. I've seen one-star reviews for a book because it says, well, it came damaged and the box was ripped open. That has nothing to do with the product, like that's shipping. So it just kind of happens that way. As far as who to pitch, when you are pitching someone, whether you're pitching them and just asking for review or if you're looking for paid promotion, anything along those lines, I think it's really important that you specifically look for book reviewers, bloggers, book talkers that are regularly posting about books in your genre. If this person has a huge book talk following, but they always post about young adult fiction and you have a, um, a I don't know, a women's fiction that typically would appeal to 40 to 60 year old women, doesn't matter how many followers they have, they're probably not your audience. and They're probably not going to convert for you. So I wouldn't say that's worth it. Um, so you want to pay attention to the books that they regularly review. Could yours fit up in the lineup or would it stand out in a negative way? Is their audience engaged? Meaning, are they just posting content or are people commenting and asking questions? Are they replying back? Um, and also, I would look at past books they had reviewed or promoted to see what kind of traction they're getting and see what kind of reviews that they leave. And that's what I would be looking for. Let's see, I'm not a TikTok user, but I am intrigued by BookTok and I would like to use it for my novel launch in July. Um, what is the best way to approach this? Are there BookTok uh, consultants whom I could hire to help with this? There are, honestly, from what I know of TikTok is that it is something you have to really put your time into. You're going to have to post one to three times a day and those viral videos, it's hit or miss. It's not like every time I post something goes viral. Many times when people get a viral video, it's after they've been posting for more than a month, oftentimes more than three months. So start early. Algorithms really matter on TikTok. So if you've got a TikTok account that you want for your author business, make sure everything that you're posting is very centered on reading on your genre, on books, even if it's not all about your book, because maybe your book's not out yet, you can only post so many times about your same book. Um, also, if you are in romance, posting about tropes that are in your book is selling books. It's becoming more and more important. We're seeing a lot of data and information on that. So I think knowing that you're gonna have to dedicate the time Getting a, a solid base of videos together ahead of time so that you don't feel like you're always having to create content every day. If you can backlog 30 videos and you know you've got those as backups and they're kind of evergreen and then you can create content in the middle, you're going to be better off. Um, and there are a lot of people who will say, I want to make sure I word this well. There are a lot of people who are like, oh yeah, my TikTok blew up. I can help build your TikTok or consultants on TikTok. The thing with TikTok is it was built on genuine connection and regular posting. And paying someone to do that is either going to cost an outrageous amount of money 
or it's going to be something where it's not necessarily your voice and it's not going to transfer as well. So if you do hire a consultant, I would recommend hiring someone who can help you build strategy, um, maybe even hiring a VA who can help you edit videos and things like that. But I would make sure that you and your brand and your voice are very much at the forefront because if it's not, it's going to either show right away or hurt you down the road when that consultant moves on to other things. So just know that if you're going to do it for your book, it's gotta be very book focused. Don't encourage everyone you know to follow you. You only want followers who are into reading, who are into your genre because that plays into those algorithms a lot. So you don't want mom and dad and your niece and all of your writer friends who write thrillers when you write romance to follow you because it's going to make your algorithms all wonky and it's going to hurt you big time down the line. Uh, in rewatching Brian Cohen's ad school, which I believe just finished, so Brian Cohen does those free ad challenges, the five day ad challenge. And so in rewatching those, I think he mentioned to only advertise to the first book in the series. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, Pat, we actually talked about that a little bit last week, and I agree. I almost always only advertise to the first book in series because people don't pick up the third book in the series. Or if they do click on the third book in a series, they're going to see it and go, oh, well, this is the third in a series. Let me click over to the first book, which then is not going to track your sales data. So then you're going to think your ads aren't working. So either way, it's not something I generally recommend. When you have a series, typically your focus, no matter how old the book is, how many new books you have out, your focus is typically always going to be on the first book in series. Um, best place for picture book reviews. Well, there are of course professional reviews, <clears throat> excuse me, professional reviews that you can pitch for such as School Library Journal and Book Life and things like that. So there are professional reviews, but as far as let's say endorsements. So these are may or may not be actual Amazon or Goodreads reviews, but people who have some type of credibility with children or with picture books um, and you're asking them for a review. You can go to teachers, you can go to teachers, parents, grandparents, librarians, all of these are good places to get endorsements. And then if you're looking specifically for like actual reviews, Goodreads, Amazon, parents, um, parents that you know, grandparents, uh, aunties and uncles, people like that, you really want to go to people who either are passionate about the, the project or passionate about the topic. So if you have something that's all about rescue animals, then go to people who care about rescue animals. If it's a children's book, find parents, grandparents, and essentially you're going to ask them to either buy and review, or you're going to ask if you can give them a free copy and ask them once they read it, if they're willing and they enjoyed the book to leave a review. Um, reviews are an uphill battle. It is work. I'm not kidding you guys. It is work, but the more people who read your book, the more people who will review it. So it's getting it into hands and you must ask. Most readers do not think, oh, I like this book. I should review it. They think, I like this book. Great. On to the next one. So you really have to ask and make it easy. Give people the tools they need to review your book so that you can start building that bank. And it does take time. Uh, how would you advise folks to leverage a national press release for a book award accomplishment locally? So I think what you're saying is that there was a national press release because you have a book award and you're asking how to leverage that locally. Um, if I got that right, let me know. But if I didn't, let me know that too. So if you have a press release or you're part of a national press release and you're like, wow, this is great. How can I leverage it locally? Essentially, you take that press release and you start sending it to your local press with an introduction. Hi, I'm a local author. I just won this award for my debut novel, whatever it is. Um, here is the national press release. I was wondering if you would consider running this locally or doing a book review or author interview. Can't wait to hear from you. 
Um, so that's exactly how I would leverage it. I would take what's already been done and then I'd say, hey, uh, let me pitch my local news and take it and pitch the local author angle um, and just reach out. A lot of local news, they love to see local people winning in local news. We like to hear about the people in our community doing good things. I love one of my local radio stations. They actually have a segment that is just all about good news. Every day they're like, we're gonna find something good in the world, hopefully locally, but if not, we're gonna find it elsewhere. And we're gonna talk about the good things that are happening in the news because so many times we hear about the bad things. So people love that. I think you absolutely should leverage that and reach out with that national press release to your local news stations in your newspapers or blogs, whatever it may be. Let's see, I have a new book set to release May 15th. It's ready to go, but I'm holding back publishing now to solicit reviews. Uh, you mentioned setting up a pre-order on Ingram a couple of weeks ago. How do I set up the pre-order on Ingram? I uploaded the print versions and approved them and set the publication date on sale to May 15th. You've done it, Mike. As long as you set, once you upload the book to Ingram Spark, if you set the pub date in the future and then you approve the book for distribution, so you have to make sure it's approved for distribution, give it a week or so, and then your book will show up on Amazon in print for pre-order. So sometimes when you search the title, it doesn't automatically come up. So if it's been about a week and you have enabled distribution, search your ISBN number and chances are you will find your pre-order page. And for anyone else who is wondering how to set up a pre-order um, and actually the step-by-steps of it, I do believe that there is a um, either a blog or a YouTube video where we, look, I have that, how to set up a pre-order. It's a YouTube video, I'll drop it right in. And for anyone who's watching on Facebook or who's watching our replay, you can just go to youtube.com forward slash new shelves books and type in pre-order pops right up. All right. Um, all right, we got that one. Uh, mixed feelings about my own website and just using Amazon. What are your thoughts? Um, Lawrence, I have very, very strong feelings about authors building their own space online that they own. I think social media is great. It's a great way to reach new readers. It is a great way to get your book out there, to run ads, to connect. But social media can be taken away in the drop of a hat. We have seen where people's Facebook accounts were closed, book talks were shut down, people um, had their accounts hacked or any type of whatever it is. Um, so you don't own that. When you have your own website, is a space that you own. It's a space where you can have branded. It's a space where you can collect your reader email addresses. So you own that contact and you can get in touch with them. So I feel the same way about the social media as I do about Amazon. Amazon's wonderful. I think that it's a great way to build reviews. A lot of sales, the majority of sales in the U.S. come through Amazon. However, your Amazon account can be shut down. Amazon could decide that your book isn't compliant in some way and remove it. There's all sorts of things that can happen. So building just on someone else's platform like Amazon or social media is really risky because they own it. It's their playground. They can kick you out. So I'm not saying don't build there, but I am saying that you should at the very minimum have your own website, the basics there so that people know where to find you if for some reason other accounts are shut down. And I think that's something we should always keep in mind is own your space online, get your website, grab your URL under your name, your book series, whatever it is that you're branding. And then also make sure that you are collecting email addresses from readers or you're inviting readers to sign up for news updates or a free product or something so that you actually own your reader's contact information. You can use it for future book launches and pitching to them. You can use it to ask for reviews. You can pitch it um, just to connect with your readers. There's so many ways that you can use that. So I do not recommend relying on Amazon or social media or anything um, to grow your business 
fully. I think it should always have the foundation of your own website in your own space. All right. Um, what about getting my book onto the radar of Bookstagram reviewers? You got to pitch them. A lot of them have online forms you can pitch out. If you've been following a bookstagram or you feel like they would truly and really enjoy your book, you can always message them, um, but you've got to pitch them. Bookstagrammers occasionally will just come across a book that they that they picked up, but most of the time they're being pitched and, and asked if they'd be interested in a copy. So if you have found a bookstagrammer you love or you have found bookstagrammers that you feel are really have the audience that you want to reach, be friendly with them, be part of their community, support them, follow them, like their posts, interact and pitch them. That's the best way to go about it. Let's see, so many things to do. Is there one group for reviews we can focus on? Is BookBub best? Uh, no, <laughs> so I love BookBub, I love Goodreads. I think they're both valuable. However, if I'm going to build reviews, typically I always say, please leave a review anywhere online, and then I list them all out. Goodreads, BookBub, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, anywhere you're comfortable, please leave a book review. But if I was actually purposely trying to build reviews, I'd be trying to build reviews on Amazon because studies show us that 86% of people rely on reviews and check them before they buy a product on Amazon. And 91% of ebook sales and last Last I heard, it may have updated because, of course, we have new sales data from last year, but last I heard, approximately 56% of print books were being bought on Amazon. So having that social credibility and proof on Amazon helps convert sales. So if I was purposely trying to build up reviews for my book, I would be focusing more on Amazon and Goodreads. If I am reviewing books and I wanted to build up my own uh repertoire and um, kind of my reviews, I would probably go with BookBub or Goodreads. So they're kind of, uh, they're all for authors, but how you use them as an author are, are a little bit different in my opinion. Follow up on that pre-order question. I didn't enable distribution yet. Is there a right time to do that on um, Ingram Spark so that the print book will not appear too early? I don't want the Ingram print version to interfere with the Amazon Kindle release. So the Amazon Kindle and the print version are totally separate. The Kindle version will come out no matter what. The pre-order is just paperback. So you can put that up anytime. What happens is the Amazon Kindle and the Ingram Spark print version end up putting on the same page because it goes by your ISBN. So they get linked to the same page. Ingram will do your pre-order. And then when the book comes out, you of course have to click the, the distribution button on KDP. Um, I will say typically KDP approves titles really quickly. Most of the time when doing a book launch, I approve that KDP, KDP file the day before a launch and it's up within hours. Um, I had a launch this week, approved that file on Monday. It's still in review. So there are glitches. The book's still up because it is up through Ingram Spark and Ingram and other um, retailers, but glitches happen. I mean, that's the thing with print on demand is when you have print on demand and when you're doing the indie side of publishing, you have amazing tools like KDP and Ingram Spark, but they don't necessarily give you control like you if you were a traditional press or publisher. So you simply don't have that control. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, it's just the process. So uh, Mike, I know you're a veteran at this. I know this is not your first book, but a lot of times you do what you can do. You set up the best as you can, but then you got to roll with punches and just know that you did what you can do and you're waiting on other people sometimes. But as far as when to set that distribution to enabled, I would do it right away. So your book shows up for pre-order right away. And again, it's not going to affect the Kindle release at all. 
Um, we are creating a spiral bound workbook. Um, and Lulu has been recommended for printing the first batch of 500. We also have lots of questions, but can't find a way to reach them. Any experience with Lulu and also how to contact them? Um, Lulu is not known for their accessibility and easy to reach or answering questions. They are a great platform for printing different books, especially if it's something outside the realm of what you can do on Amazon or KDP for print on demand. So spiral bound notebooks and specialty sizes, Lulu is really known for that. And it's a great tool, but they are very much there to be a platform for you to use and upload. They are not really there to troubleshoot or be your customer service. Um, I'm sure they have a contact us button. I'm sure they have tools there, but they are notoriously hard to reach for that kind of thing. And so um, all I can say is keep trying, try an email, try a phone number, try a contact us button, uh, create an account and put in a help ticket through your account and see where that gets you. Um, but it's just not, it's not as, as, um, well, like I said, it's a print on demand company and they're there to print and not so much with the customer service. So in my experience, always, always, I want to quantify. This is always my experience, my clients' experiences. I'm not saying that other people haven't like had amazing customer service or gotten in touch with them on the first try um, by any means, but this is my opinion and my experience. I'm a new author and would like to know what self-publishing company would you prefer? Or is there a better way to self-publish? Um, so Diane, as far as self-publishing, there, when you're self-publishing, it actually means that you're publishing under your own name. You are your publisher. It doesn't mean that you have to do everything on your own or that you have to learn how to design a cover and everything else. It means that you are the publisher. You're the business behind the book. And so you can work with a cover designer. You can work with a consultant who helps walk you through the steps of publishing. But ultimately, you own that book once it publishes. You have self-published. Um, so that's what that means as far as self-publishing. And there are a lot of people and providers who can help you do that, where essentially you're paying them to either walk you through the steps or create your files and get your cover and your interior done. Um, I strongly recommend that you look at places like Readsy, look at the Alliance of Independent Authors has like a approved checklist. Um, IBPA has different uh, places. Uh, here at New Shelves, I do consulting for self-publishing where I help you create a plan and give you the steps you need to self-publish and then help connect you to resources. So you can certainly reach out to New Shelves as well. Um, but that's self-publishing. Then we've got hybrid publishing. Hybrid publishing is where you're working with a publisher and typically you're going to subsidize the cost of creating the book. So you are going to pay all or part of the production of the book. So for that editing, the cover design and everything else. And that publisher is going to do the work of getting it done for you. And then they publish the book and they are the, the you know, the owner of the title will say, and they pay you royalties after that. So that's a hybrid publisher. And then there's pay to play or vanity press, which we talk about where simply you're paying someone to publish your book. You are fronting all costs to print market. It's less of a partnership and more of a paying for a product. Um, some people that fits for them. Some people just want to book out for their grandkids or they just want certain things. <clears throat> Excuse me. But um, a pay to play or vanity press literally is just paying to get your own files and things like that. Um, I often say it's a bit like self publishing. Uh, you're fronting all the costs, all the money, you're kind of on your own. But the difference is, is that someone else gets to control your book and they split royalties with you. So uh, as you can see, Vanity Press isn't very popular for most people, um, but it all depends on you and your goals and what you want out of your author and publishing journey. So there are definitely those different um, different steps there. And again, over at New Shelves, we do 15 minute calls where if you're kind of trying to figure it out and you would like to actually chat one on one about your goals, you can just reach out um, at info at newshelves.com. 
Uh, how much uh, marketing should a hybrid publisher offer? Dep it depends on the publisher. I work with some hybrid publishers who actually do a ton of marketing and they really partner. They have me actually do marketing webinars for their companies so that they can empower the authors. And then there are some hybrid publishers who just kind of, they give them some tools and then they're like, all right, we're good. So it really just depends on the publisher. Um, a lot of times that'll be in your contract. You definitely should look and see, ask them, you know, what do you offer as far as marketing? Is there additional cost involved or is it something that we've shared? And kind of just figure that out there. Um, and there are certainly, again, there are some publishers who do amazing things, who really are working to partner with their authors. And then some that are more hands-off. Um, marketing and publishing, whether it be hybrid or even traditional, I'm talking big name, traditional, big name. It's becoming more and more the job of the author. My real, <laughs> look, guys, I'm going to get out my soapbox. You know me. My real thing is that if it's going to become the job of the author to really promote and market their work, I think that the publisher's should do a better job of giving their authors tools of training them and empowering them to market their books if that's what they expect and need. And I think it should be pretty upfront. Hey, you're expected to really step in on a lot of this marketing, but we're going to give you the tools. We have, um, you know, marketing teams come in and do trainings once a month that you can always jump in and empower people. I feel like that's what's missing as we've shifted to authors being the one who are expected to market their books more and more. I don't feel like as we've seen that shift that we've also seen a shift of empowering the author, training and teaching the author. Because in my opinion, when you take your authors and you empower them to be their own sales team, everyone wins. The publisher makes sales and royalties. The author feels accomplished and they feel like they're really doing something they feel successful as an author and so i don't know why more publishers don't do that um maybe that's my next pitch um i'm gonna have to go out there and give it to uh to some publishers and set it out there anyway again you know i can't not have at least one soapbox every every free advice friday uh let me see i know there's some stuff over here I know, I know. All right. Uh, question from Heather. Review question again. Can I give my author copies to friends to read? Then they can leave a review. How would that work since Amazon would not have it as a verified purchase? So Amazon does not actually require that a book be purchased on their platform in order to leave a review. Um, because the book industry has historically really been based on reviews from uh, ARC teams and giving away copies. The, the rule is, is that you do not have to um, purchase a book on Amazon to leave a review. It will not be marked verified, but that's okay. The account does have to be in good standing. So the person leaving the review does have to have an active account in good standing. They must have purchased at least $50 of products in the last year. So not subscriptions, not Kindle Unlimited, Prime. It has to be product, $50 of product in the last year. Um, I have a whole video on how to ask for and actually get reviews on Amazon on YouTube. I'm going to drop that in the chat box. So you can go check it out. Again, anyone who's watching on Facebook or who is maybe catching this after the fact, just go to youtube.com slash new shelves books, type in Amazon or Amazon review and it'll pop right up. Um, we have a pretty robust blog at newshelves.com and we've got a lot of videos up on YouTube. So if you ever are like, I want to, I wonder how to do this, go search and you might find something. And if you don't find it, ask us on free advice Friday or email me and ask if I'd be willing to do a tutorial because very often I, I do that um, and do that. Yeah. And so the thing, Heather, though, about reviews is that the, the terms of Amazon are you can give someone a copy of your book and ask them to review it. You cannot say, if I give you this book, you must review it. That's considered payment. So it's always a, 
you know, I'll give you this book. And if you feel like you can leave a review, please do. <laughs> you can put the question out there, but you can't make it a requirement. Um, let me see. Uh, it's, yeah, so it used to be that you used to have to say, I received this book in exchange for an honest review. You don't have to do that anymore. That used to be the thing. Some people will still do that. You can always say, I, I am a ARC reviewer for NetGalley or, you know, thank you to NetGalley for the advanced reader copy. You can do different things like that, but it's not really expected anymore. Um, actually, that phrase, I was given this book in exchange for an honest review, was getting people's reviews kicked out because you just said I was given this book for a review, which is against their terms for payment. So it's all in those details. It's crazy. Um, let me see. I know there's a lot of chat going on. Give me a second. Oops. Uh, I have reviews. I just want to make sure I didn't check anything. Oh, yeah. Publishers are in the business to grow their own companies. For sure, for sure. I think, again, I really wish that um, publishers, especially those big publishers, I mean, HarperCollins and, and the people who... A lot of them have one publicist or marketer for a lot of people. And again, the authors are really expected. Their next book deal depends on how many books they sell. And they're really expected to kind of market themselves. I really wish that these companies, especially the large ones that have the budget, I wish that while they still kept their marketing teams and they certainly invested in the marketing that the marketing teams do, I really wish that they worked more either in-house or with consultants like me um, who would train their authors on how to market themselves. Empowering your authors to be your sales force is only going to earn everybody money you are training them how to sell their own book and if you expect that from them if you want that from them because it's going to help your bottom line and it's going to help that author be successful which they really want authors really especially new authors they want to be successful they have put their heart into this their time into this let's empower them to do that and do it successfully and i think the the big publishers should be doing that i think they should provide those resources rather than hoping or expecting that authors are going to go out and find it or pay additional marketing consultants. You literally could hire one company, one person, one team to come in and give trainings and empower the authors who care to show up. Again, I don't know why they don't do this, but I think it's uh, something that should absolutely be done. I Even hybrid publishers, again, I work with hybrid publishers who do exactly that, who either provide their own trainings or they call in experts to provide trainings to help their authors sell their own books. It just makes sense to me. Um, that's right. I wonder who could do that kind of training. I don't know. Call me. Um, anyway, I think it's fun. All right, you guys, it is 1054. Let me check. I know I had emailed questions. I think I answered them, but I want to make sure. Oh yeah, so there was kind of a question that came up um, about audiobook AI. So Apple, um, if you're on our newsletter, that just went out recently. On my, and if you've been on Free Advice Friday, you've heard me talk about how Apple has recently kind of quietly launched their AI narrated audiobooks. They have Madison as their female voice right now and uh, Jackson as their male voice. And the question that came up is, can I use them? So these voices are only for certain um, genres at the moment. And Amazon is accepting applications to use their AI narration for audiobooks. It's not open season, you can't just go use it. You actually have to go to Apple, submit your application, and they will let you know whether or not they are going to allow you to use their AI to create your audiobook. Um, and as more voices come out, I'm sure that more opportunities will arise. But it's not just for everyone. You do have to submit. And the other question that came up was about pricing audiobooks. So most of your online platforms for audiobooks um, will 
those audiobooks will have like a pricing recommendation. So they'll say, you know, books in your genre at this length typically sell for whatever it is. And they'll give you a funky number, like $7.97. So don't do that. Round up to like, you know, a number that you commonly see in sales, like $9.99. Typically, you want your audiobook to be. Um, either pretty close to your print book price or in between your ebook and your print book price. Um, you want to make sure you cover your cost and that it's competitive as well. But typically, closer to the print book price, ebook can often be um, less expensive. So closer to the print book price or in between your ebook and your print book price. Yeah, it's unclear who they're actually accepting. So they are only accepting certain people. They're basing it off of um, right now, from what I've learned for AI um, narration through Apple, their two voices only concentrate on certain um, genres right now. So romance, uh, I think one is historical fiction with a little bit of literary fiction. So they're only accepting certain things. And I have heard, um, I have heard that they are kind of accepting books that are already kind of selling in ebook form. So they are looking for people who have a catalog that's already kind of actively selling in ebook and trying to amp that up into audiobook. So some of them are rejected, but they do say that even if it's um, rejected, that it will stay on file. So if it stays on file, you know, it could come up later. You just never know. Uh, yeah, exactly. And you apply through, exactly. You apply through draft to digital. So if your eBooks or your, if your books are in Kindle Unlimited, um, they're Amazon exclusive. It's not draft to digital. Draft to digital is how you're typically applying because draft to digital is how they are distributing uh, the audiobooks at the moment. So yeah, it's all tied in for sure. All right, you guys, we are good for today. Um, I know we've had a lot of questions about chat GPT. I have been talking to um, quite a few people actually in the IT industry, talking to authors who are using that. So We'll be covering that either next Friday or I will do a special YouTube video and post it. So if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, I recommend that you just hop on over there, new shelves, or I'm sorry, youtube.com slash new shelves books and subscribe because um, I may just put it up as its own video or we may cover it on Friday next week. But um, lots of interesting information, very varying opinions on ChatGPT. So we'll be talking about that soon. And of course, if you have questions for next Friday, join us live at 10 a.m. Eastern or just email your questions into info at newshelves.com and I'll save them, stash them away for Friday. All right, you guys, thank you for being here. It was wonderful and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.